Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we do indeed need living water. May it flow through your word into us this day and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, there was a classic, a classic put down. Something really nasty you could say back in the days when we had pay phones. Remember those days? And especially back in the day when a phone call and a pay phone cost a dime. And so the saying was this. If you wanted to really put someone down, maybe they were complaining or whatever, they were trying to tell you something, you'd say, here's the dime. Go call someone who cares. <laughs> nice, huh? What a put down. It would actually probably have worked for the woman at the well if you wanted to put her down, this unnamed woman at the well. Because she had maybe one person in, her enti in the entire world who cared about her, and he wasn't even her husband. Five times she was either divorced or widowed. We don't know. We don't know. Either way, in that status, she was at the absolute bottom of the society, and she would basically have had almost no way to make a living. Starvation was a huge risk. And now she's with the man that reading tells us, that Jesus tells us actually, who isn't her husband, which would have in those ultra traditional days have been outrageous. She would have been an utter outcast in that society. Why else would she go to this well with this um, uh, jar, why would she go to the well by herself in the middle of the day at noon, the hottest time of the day, and it was like a half hour, the Jacob's well is about a half hour outside of the town of Sychar. Why would she do this? The answer, no one wanted to be near her. One of my seminary professors named Obrey Hendricks. He wrote a novel about this woman, and it's called Living Water. And in the novel, Dr. Hendricks, he takes his novelists too. He took substantial license to imagine her life, especially her life before, but also after, but especially before she encounters Christ. Her childhood is described as a really happy childhood. She was a little girl and he beautifully describes it. He not just describes it, she lives it. You, you meet her, you know her. She had uncommon confidence and curiosity. And she had this wonderful spark and a sense of joy that just could not be squelched. She had chutzpah. And then she goes and grows up and encounters, well, the marriage rules and this patriarchal and male-dominated society with its arranged marriages. And also the novel talks about, and no doubt this was true at least in, in, in parts, of threats and even violence in the home. And she encounters one ugly, dispiriting situation after another. And out of preservation, she gradually learns to squelch, to control this spark, this chutzpah that she has, to the point where she seemed, well, the spark seemed dead, and her joy was gone, and in fact, you really, it felt like in the novel, she was dead. That is, until she met this most surprising man at this well, and she comes back to life. It's like the little girl in her comes back to life, and we get to see that. And the next thing you know, she's running. I am, well, it doesn't say she's running, I don't think. But she's, I imagine her running into town, excitingly, excitedly telling everybody about this, this man she's met and wondering aloud with amazement, he, he, maybe he's the, the Messiah. And miracle of miracles, the people actually listen to her. They take her seriously. And so we've got to ask, what in the world happened here? 
How did she go from being dead to being alive, from a nobody to one of the most beloved characters in the Bible and a saint in some corners, some parts of the Catholic Church? How did that conversation with Jesus change her so much? It's actually, this conversation is actually the longest, I think by a decent margin, the longest conversation that Jesus has with any individual one-on-one -on -one in the, all of the Gospels. What did she learn from him? Well, it's actually not all that clear. And that's part of the beauty. First, Jesus asks her for water, and she's confused and surprised, and she basically says, you don't even have a bucket. What are you talking about? And then she says, you, you, you're, a, you're a Jew and an esteemed one, she could tell, and I'm a Samaritan. And furthermore, she doesn't actually say it, but I'm a woman. You're not supposed to be talking to me. Do you have any idea who I am? But Jesus is unfazed, and he just keeps on talking. And the next thing you know, he's offering her something called living water. And what he says is it would satisfy her thirst, not just for today, but eternally. And at first she thinks he's speaking literally as opposed to spiritually. And then he gets personal with her. And they talk about her life, her sad, hard life. And in that society, a morally ambiguous life. And maybe most surprising in this conversation is he's not doing this. He's not condemning her. Instead, he actually seems interested. In fact, he seems more than interested. He seems to understand her. And even more than that, he seems to know her. And that makes her marvel that maybe this, she starts to think of him as a prophet with this prophetic power to understand and know her. The story, by the way, isn't over yet. There's more. Then they go into this Samaritan uh, Jewish tension that Pastor Moira talked about, which was 400 years, four dec about four decades in the making. I won't go into the details of it, but it was an intense hatred that they had. Many differences. The Samaritans, the, the Jews uh, uh, thought of them basically as half-breeds, and what specifically, this is sort of obscure, but what's specifically alluded to in this reading is that the, the home of, of Jewish worship were, was in uh, Jerusalem, of course, in the temple. Well, the, the Samaritans lived north, and they had um, a, a, a Mount Gerizim, which is right near where Sychar is. It's actually in Nablus now in the West Bank. It's a real place. And the Jacob's Well is a real thing. But that, Mount Gerizim was where the, the Samaritans worshipped. And to a Jew, that would have been seen as gigantic sacrilege. But Jesus surprises her again. And this was groundbreaking. He said those differences don't really matter. He explains that because God is spirit... You can worship God anywhere. In fact, he says, you're talking, you're basically, he says, you're talking to God right now. I'm he. I am he is what he says, the Messiah. Now, by any measure, this is a confusing conversation. And it's by no means clear what she understands and what she doesn't understand. But what is extremely clear is that after the conversation, she is not afraid anymore. And she is not ashamed anymore. She is so excited and cannot wait to run into town where she would have been afraid to go before and tell everybody she could tell. I actually think it's helpful not to overanalyze the conversation. You could drive yourself crazy over analyzing this conversation. But it's important to step back and see what she experienced. And what she experienced was someone completely different 
than she'd ever known or seen before. Someone who did not care about old boundaries or religious boundaries or gender boundaries, but instead who seemed to, didn't care about those things, but instead seemed to care about her. Whether she fully understood, understood everything he says, honestly, whether we fully understand everything he says here about living water and God is spirit, that, at least in this story, is not what appears to be most important. What she knew for certain instead, or not instead, but what she knew for certain, however, was that this guy brought a whole new outlook. Helped her have a whole new outlook on herself, and on the world, less harsh, less judgmental, more forgiving, more loving, more hopeful. Friends, the implications, the implications of our friend's conversation with Jesus far transcend just this unnamed woman's personal faith. What she saw, what she experienced, was a completely new way of seeing the world that didn't obsess over old taboos or old hatreds. A world where it actually didn't matter that she was a Samaritan or a woman or divorced or whatever taboo it was at the time. All of this leads us, I think, in our time to ask, but at any time, really, but our time, to ask, do we, to ask of ourselves and to ask of our society, do we, do I, do you, does the church, does you name it, the country, do we have the equivalent of Samaritans in our lives and in our worldviews? To be frank, it seems to me that one of the, 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 the major issues that we all know about and we're wrestling with today is this polarization. And I, I think the implication of that is that we do, in a way, have our own Samaritans. Something, sometimes it could be that our political differences or our, our religious or our racial differences, whatever it is that's driving this wedge between us where people... Maybe there's an awful lot of looking at people who disagree with us and, 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 and maybe infuriate us. In this great story, Jesus diagnoses this stubborn human problem. It was then and it's now. Division between human beings, what keeps us apart. And Jesus sets about dealing with it in the story in a really basic and I, I think in a way a surprising way he does it by treating the other person, in this case the woman as well, by treating the other person as a person. That's where he seems to start at a human, at a personal level, which I think we know this. It's that's where barriers are so often broken down in this world. When you get to know someone. Have you ever heard the expression, you can't get there. You cannot get there from here. You cannot get, you can't get there from here. Well, the best way, if you look at a map, to get from Judea or Jerusalem, up to Galilee, which was the northern part where Jesus was from. And this is where he was headed in this story. He and the disciples were headed south, from south to north. The, by far the easiest, and you didn't want to go out of your way in those days because you were on foot. It was a long way to go, 125 miles. The best way to do it was directly through Samaria. That was absolutely not the way to go. You were to avoid that at all costs. It's almost like you couldn't get there from here, at least that way. That's not the way Jesus thinks. 
then it's not the way I think he's telling us to think. He wants all of his, God wants all of his children, Jesus wants all of his children to find ways to get along and get along. And that could mean going through Samaria. Now, maybe we might think that's asking for trouble. And anyway, with all of our divisions nowadays, with our, with our bubbles that we maybe are stuck in or our anger rising all the time, maybe it just seems like an incurable problem. It just seems you can't, it just seems you cannot get there from here. Hopeless. Well, Jesus did not see it that way. Jesus didn't see our unnamed friend. He didn't see her life as, as hopeless. And I can't imagine he thinks that human beings getting along is hopeless. In fact, I think this reading is telling us a lot, but it's a, maybe the most important thing it's telling us is that we can. We can get there from here. We need hope. And Jesus gives it to us. Amen.